Welcome to Oncology Data Advisor. Today, we're excited to be discussing this week's expanded FDA approval of enzalutamide for non-metastatic castration-sensitive prostate cancer with biochemical recurrence. And I'm joined by Dr. Stephen Friedland, who co-led the study, which led to the approval. Dr. Friedland, thanks so much for coming on today. Well, thanks for having me. It's, it's certainly an exciting time to be here. So for a little bit of background before we kind of dive into the trial, what does biochemical recurrence mean in prostate cancer and how is it generally treated? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, when we say biochemical, we typically mean PSA. So PSA is, is at least an early stage pro prostate cancer is, is to a certain degree the end all be all. It's how we diagnose, it's how we follow patients afterwards. And so patients will typically get diagnosed with an elevated PSA, we do a biopsy, find cancer. If it's high, you know higher risk, we will do surgery, radiation, and we follow the PSA afterwards. And we want that PSA to be super low. After surgery, it should be zero. After radiation, it should be very low. But when it starts to rise, and we have different definitions of, of rise, right? Um, but once it reaches certain thresholds, we now say that is biochemical recurrence, PSA recurrence, PSA relapse, biochemical relapse, goes by a number of different names. Um, but that's what we're talking about is they've had surgery, they've had a radiation, and now there's evidence that that didn't cure the cancer. And we do imaging, you know, bone scan, CT, which was done in this study, the traditional, and we see nothing. And so the question is, you know, what do we do for those patients? And it's, it's kind of been this quagmire unknown for, for a long time. Mm -hmm. So what was the Embark trial investigating for this population? Yeah, so we know, you know, for these patients that typically we'd like to try and get a second round of, of salvage local therapy, maybe some salvage radiation in there, but eventually the tumor keeps the PSA as a marker, the tumor keeps going up and up, and we're ready to start systemic therapy, hormonal therapy. It's kind of been our first line. Hormonal therapy dates back to the 1940s. And so the question is, can we improve upon that? And so that's what Embark set out to ask, um, was patients with high risk, so doubling times less than nine months, so those at highest risk of developing metastases and dying of their cancer, and they're randomized to ADT alone, which is the way we've been doing this for an awful long time, versus ADT plus enzalutamide, what we call enza combo therapy, that was the primary analysis in a double blind fashion. And then there was a really interesting part of Embark is that third arm is the enzalutamide monotherapy. So enzalutamide without ADT. And that was also compared to ADT alone. And the primary outcome was looking at metastasis free survival. So either metasta developing metastasis or dying. And there's some pretty strong data that that actually is a surrogate of overall survival in patients with localized prostate cancer. So that was the goal is can we improve upon, you know, decades worth of conventional wisdom that we need ADT? Can we, can we move the bar for these patients? Sounds like a really important question to address. So what did the results of the study show? Yeah, so <clears throat> the primary results, again, the metastasis-free survival actually showed very, very dramatic delays with the combination therapy and it actually reduced the risk of metastasis or death by 58%, really, really dramatic. If we look at the five-year risk of developing metastasis or death, it was, um, or let me say, not having metastasis, not dying, so being alive, no metastasis, 71% in the control arm, 87% in the combination arm. So really dramatic improvements. Also showed delays in time to PSA progression, um, time to metastasis, next um, subsequent therapy, and actually a suggestion of overall survival. Even though it's very early, it's an interim analysis, hazard ratio is 0.59, p-value of 0.015, didn't meet our, our threshold for statistically significant, but clearly moving in the right direction. And really intriguingly, if we look at the monotherapy, so to, to me, that was kind of that the known. We, I had, I think a lot of us had very strong suspicions that combination therapy was really going to blow the socks off the, the ADT alone. Um, the question was about the monotherapy. It was a little bit more of an unknown, a little bit more of a risk, but that also beat ADT alone with a 37% delay in metastasis or 
uh, death. Also meeting time to PSA progression, time to metastasis, next therapy. And if we look at the um, interim overall survival for that, hazard ratio is 0.78, p-value of 0.23. So, so clearly not statistically significant, but also at least moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, it's so exciting to hear, you know, such impressive results. What do these results mean for the treatment of patients with prostate cancer um, and high-risk biochemical recurrence going forward? So I think what it means is we finally have therapies that can delay the cancer, delay progression. And in the long run, we're seeing some early evidence of it, but we need to keep following the patients, is we can actually make patients live longer. So that's pretty exciting in the, this disease space of patients who, who you know, have already undergone surgery, radiation, with the hope that that would cure the cancer, and obviously it didn't. And so that's you know, a very challenging space in terms of dealing with someone who had such high hopes and aspirations of being cancer-free, and now they're told they're not, and oh my God, the PSA is going up quick. We don't know what to do. Um, many patients feel like it's a death sentence. Um, we try to reassure them it's a long natural history, but now we actually have therapies that can make it longer, you know, delay that progression. And so that's a real comfort, I think, we'll, we'll see um, to physicians and, and to patients. I think patients will, will want this kind of therapy to keep the tumor under control as long as possible. Definitely, that's fantastic. Um, so as physicians begin to prescribe it for this new indication, um, are there any yeah. adverse events of note with uh, enzalutamide or other considerations to keep in mind with it? Yeah, no, absolutely. So enzalutamide is a drug that's been out for over 10 years now. We have a lot of experience with this drug um, in more advanced stages. And what we found in this trial is the, the good news is we found nothing new. Mm -hmm. So there are side effects of this drug and we saw them. So we saw more hot flashes, saw more fatigue relative to ADT alone. Um, a little bit more hypertension, some more falls and things. Um, you did see a more cognitive and memory impairment, but importantly, if we look at grade three or higher cognitive impairment, less than 1% and identical to ADT alone. So, um, and we did see a couple of seizures, which again, all known side effects of enzalutamide. So I think the, the key thing is we didn't see anything new. Um, with monotherapy, interestingly, we saw an equal amount of fatigue, but much less hot flashes, much lower. We saw more nipple and gynecomastia, nipple pain and gynecomastia. Um, so I'd say the side effects are different between them. They're not necessarily less. Um, we did look at global quality of life and I saw absolutely no difference across the three arms, which is really reassuring that we're not worsening quality of life. There actually was a suggestion, um, statistically significant, that sexual function was better preserved with monotherapy. So whereas hormonal symptoms were slightly worse with combination, which kind of makes sense. Um, though the difference in time to deterioration was a difference of one day versus control. Um, so the side effects are different, that there are side effects, um, but I think at the, at the end of the day, we can say we're not worsening quality of life and we're delaying tumor progression. So it's, it's a pretty strong statement that we can give to our patients that we're not going to make them feel worse and we're going to help them live hopefully better by delaying their progression and hopefully live longer. Awesome. That's great to know. Um, so I know you mentioned this is the interim analysis. Are there any additional directions that future analyses will be exploring? Yeah, so one of the things that was really unique and, and very intriguing about Embark was at 36 weeks of therapy, a PSA just checked. And if less than 0.2, patients could actually go off therapy. They got a treatment holiday. And we saw in the combination arm, over 90% of patients got this treatment holiday, 80, over 85% in combination, but only two thirds on the ADT alone. And the duration of their off therapy was longer in the combination arm. So we're now starting to look at what are the predictors of who got that off treatment cycle, who stayed off 
that treatment long term. And what's interesting is if you look, for example, at the monotherapy, um, the testosterone there, you're not castrate. So once you go off the therapy, the, the pills, the enzalutamide, you have normal testosterone levels. And we saw at five years later, it was about 5% of people whose PSA had not risen to that threshold to restart therapy. So they were essentially off therapy for five years with normal testosterone levels. So the question is, who are those people? That's like winning the jackpot. You know, you get eight, nine months of therapy. And yes, again, there are toxicities and side effects. I don't want to minimize that, but eight, nine months of therapy, and then you're getting five years off therapy, treatment-free, normal testosterone. So can we start to identify those patients? So we're, we're going to, right now, we're kind of looking at that and really trying to understand um, that aspect. We're also digging into some of the secondary outcomes. Um, so in short, analyzing the data we have, but we're also continuing to follow the patients for overall survival and hope to, at some point in the future, um, have an update about that. And that, that will be hopefully, hopefully, very exciting uh, follow-up data. Awesome. It'll definitely be exciting to see those results going forward. Yeah. So as we wrap up, anything else you'd like to mention about either the trial or the approval? I, I think, you know, for, for 80 years, we've done hormonal therapy and it's been castration. It started out with orchiectomy, estrogens, then we had LHRH agonist injections. We now have LHRH antagonist pills, injections. We have a lot of options, but they all bring testosterone down and they all work. What we're realizing is coming from the advanced stage, moving earlier and earlier, is that ADT alone for these high risk bad tumors is not enough. You really need to intensify that ADT. And that's ADT plus a novel hormonal agent. And these novel hormonal agents, particularly NZ and, and Bark study, is so powerful, we may not even need ADT anymore. And so really, A, hopefully it is the, the nearing the end of ADT alone as a th therapy. There's always exceptions, the older, sicker guy where we need some therapy, but he's not going to tolerate the more aggressive, you know, 90-year-old on oxygen, need, but has metastatic disease, needs something. There's always exceptions to every rule. But in general, I'm hoping that ADT alone is going by the wayside. And, and I think that's what this study shows us more than anything. So yes, it's an expansion of the label for enzalutamide. It's an exciting option for patients, but I think it's just the, the increasing recognition that ADT alone has a very minor role, if any, to play now in prostate cancer. Awesome. Well, it's so great to hear more about the trial and the approval and everything that it means for patients with prostate cancer. So thanks so much for coming on today to talk about all of this. No, thanks so much for having me. It's, it's always great to chat with you, Kira.